How are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing awesome. So stoked to be here. Super, super happy. And like, I'm ready to get the game started right now. I'm so, I'm just, I'm just ready to get on the sand. All right, man. Well, before we get into the sand, we're going to put our feet to the carpet, I guess, and talk through this interview. Well, get, give me like the, the short bio line right now. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? All right. My name's Austin Lee Kuhn. I'm 26 years old. I grew up in California, but I'm now an MBA student at the University of Chicago. So doing that right now in Chicago. Um, I'm actually like, I think right now I'm supposed to be taking a midterm for like my supply chain management class, but I get to be ditching that to be here. I'm sure the prop will understand. So I'm feeling really good to be here. Extra good that I don't have to study. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You're going to a very different type of school right now. You're about <laughs> to go to the school of hard knocks when it comes to Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I'm going to learn more here, honestly. So let's see how that goes. Well, so what has led you out here in the first place? I know you're excited to get on that sand, but what has led you to believe that you should be on that sand in the first place? I guess, I mean, like what led me, what started me in the whole survivor journey is, is really my mom. Like she's been watching ever since like the first, first episode. And like, at first, you know, that, you know, that came out when I was like, you know, like six or seven or something like that. And back then, like, or no did my math wrong. I was four then. Um, but back then, like I was not like huge in reality TV. I didn't really watch Survivor. Like I love playing video games. I love like watching hockey games and stuff like that. But like, I remember I came home once over Christmas break and like my mom would always be watching like, you know, these reality TV shows and especially Survivor just like by herself in the living room. And like, you know, one day I came back, I was like, man, it's kind of sad. Like I should just sit and watch with her. And then like, instantly hooked and I was like this is so awesome so I just binged everything and like we text every single day about like survivor strategies we call all the time like this whole like process getting here has been like a shared dream so that's really what got me here um and yeah so I'm just super excited I know she is super excited she's gonna be so excited like hearing me on this podcast too like she's a huge fan so like this is awesome this is awesome well, hello, Mrs. Kuhn. So nice to to hear you. Shout out <laughs> right now for getting your boy here. So that being said, through all through all the watching you're doing, uh, give me one Survivor winner and one non-winner that you would identify with the most, personally, strategically, whatever you want to use. Yeah, I think uh, non-winner, I'm going to go with Owen Knight. I think just came from season 43, you know, similar kind of long-haired Asian, loves the outdoors, kind of never say die attitude. And like, you know, it was actually kind of crazy because when I was applying for this season, like the cast announcements just came out for 43 and like mm. I was looking at it and I like came across Owen Knight and I was just like, are you kidding me? Like, they don't even need me anymore. Like they literally just <laughs> cast me like, why do I even need to like submit an application? Luckily, you know, I ended up watching the season and like we're, we're very different people. We just have a lot of similarities. So that was really exciting to hear. But um, but yeah, that I would say Owen Knight, definitely the one I identify most most. That's a non-winner. Winner, I got to say, I think I think the winner I identify with most would probably be like Jay or a Wendell, just in terms of how they're going to be playing and how I want to play. You know, they're huh. seen by a lot of people as big threats, you know, very physical. But I think the base of their game really revolves around their connections with other people, one on one relationships and using that to make their threat level a little less noticeable to other people or like, you know, make other people be like, yeah, you know, you're a big threat. But I still want you here because you're fun to hang out with kind of thing. So those are the two that I feel like I'll try emulating a little bit out there. Yeah, from what I've seen that you submitted before talking with me, I mean, it seems like you kind of described yourself as a bit of a chameleon, right? You talk about how you could be this adventurous hippie one minute and then like the anime lover the next minute. You talk about going to Australia and then DC and Indiana. Like you feel like you have done so many things over the course of your life. Has that just given you a, a natural adaptability that you hope to bring to the game? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you look at me now and I was nothing like this, like even like 10, 12 years ago or something like that. Like, I feel like I was a, a shell of my current self. Like I was very introverted. I was very quiet. I was very scared of doing things like even like raising my hand in class, like would petrify me kind of thing. And then like slowly and surely I started, you know, moving to new places, trying new experiences and just like kind of like building up my own confidence and then, you know, ultimately led me to get here. But I think like I think like living that entire like introversion, extroversion spectrum has like made me a more empathetic person. And because of that, you know, I can connect with someone who just wants to like sit in the room, play video games and not talk to a single person for like eight hours because I've been there. And I can also, you know, talk with the people who want to just go out and have a good time and, you know, party too, because I've also been there. What's your favorite moment in Survivor history? <laughs> okay. I think, okay. I can think of two moments. The first one, 
um, is Heroes versus Villains, the very first challenge where Coach just demoralizes Colby in that <laughs> challenge. I thought that was hilarious because Colby's like carrying Coach over and Coach is like looking at his tribe being like, <laughs> like, just wait. And then like at the end, Colby's all tired. He just carries him over, gets the point, And then like Colby's kind of ruined for the rest of the season from that. I just thought that was hilarious. <gasps> um big coach fan second one um I really loved I remember watching all stars and just like that whole story with Rob and Amber was like super awesome and that was like kind of a dream I was like man maybe one day I'll find my Amber out there on the island like that'd be so cool so like that was a really cool moment so I think those two are my favorite moments on Survivor now is that an intention you have carried over to this day I mean listen the, the Matt and Freddie okay, of it I, all it, I have to ask <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not really an intention more so, you know, go with the flow, whatever happens, happens, open to it. But I'm definitely not looking for it because at the end of the day, it's about the million dollars. It's about the title. Anything else is extra. So I got to get into perception with you because you talk about, right, this like Halley Surfer vibe. You talk about, again, this internal ability to like morph yourself into any environment. How do you think the people out here on your tribe are going to perceive you initially? You know, I think it's hard not to look at me and be like, uh, woo, or, you know, Ozzy or something like that. And that's fine with me. I'm happy if people look at me and they immediately assume a woo or, you know, character like that, because like, you know, those, those players are known for their physical ability, sometimes their social ability, but none of them are really known to be strategists. And I think that's mm. kind of something that I'll be bringing into the game that people aren't going to be aware of. And I'm going to try underplaying that because I can't hide my physical strength. Can't really hide talking to people, but I'll be able to hide sort of the strategy going behind the scenes. You talk about physical strain in terms of the prep level that you had going into this. Was there anything in particular you did once you found out you'd be here today in the months leading up to this? Oh my gosh. I've been training for this for years, but I guess just wow. looking at like the past couple months, I mean, like, you know, I did like a 60 hour fast. That was one thing I was like, you know, like my classmates are like, why are you fasting for so long? Like, you're crazy. I'm like, you know, I just want to see if I can do it. You know, obviously can't tell them that I'm going to be here. Um, you know, I've been working out twice a day. I've been like playing hockey, boxing, volleyball. A couple of years ago when like my dream of being on Survivor was like starting to like really peak and like, you know, carried over to now. I like did a 230 mile backpacking trip in the John Muir Trail. So like started at the base of Yosemite. I like climbed to the top of Half Dome and then like I backpacked with like 40 pounds on my back, 230 miles to Mount Whitney. And I climbed that. And like the entire time I was like thinking about Survivor, how I'd win it. And it was just, you know, it was just like sort of a Zen moment, just thinking about Survivor being like, this is what I got to do. I got to just be prepared. I can do whatever I can. And I got to crush it once I'm there. Let's talk about your competition a bit. What characteristics do you want in an alliance partner, ideally? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people, they talk about, yeah, you know, like I want someone who's loyal to me and all that. Like, obviously that's like a given. I think what I'm really looking for is someone who will laugh with me, who's fun to hang out with. Like laughter is truly the key to my heart. So like, you know, if we're vibing and we're laughing together, then I know we'll be able to trust each other. We'll be able to make some moves together. So laughter, that's the number one thing. Make me laugh and I'm yours. Interesting. So Obviously, you have a period of time right now where, like, you can't talk with your competition, but, like, you could certainly get impressions. <laughs> Is there anyone in particular, like, describe to me, describe to me some people that you are, you know, making eye contact with that you're thinking either, okay, this is someone that if you, we draw the same buff, best case scenario, or if they're described to me some people that you're like, okay, red flag, I'm writing your name down as soon as I get the opportunity. Oh, yeah. I've got, I've got a lot of those for both those uh, categories. I think, though, like, this is kind of the perfect season for me. I talk about laughter being the key to my heart and I'm like looking around and I can tell that this cast has got more than a couple goobers, like myself included. It's going to be hilarious. I think it'll be an all time funny season. Like just like sensing the vibes of people. Obviously we can't talk, but like you can feel that like funny energy coming from people. Um, there's a, there's this other guy with like long hair, like brown, long hair, like you know, I would love to work with him. We could be like the flow bros or something. And just like, he seems like a really funny dude. Um, definitely big green flags from him. Um, red flag. Okay. There's one guy, big Afro. And uh, I could tell he's someone who's going to be playing all sides. Like he's smiling at every, like, you know, looking at everybody. And it just like, you, know, you can't talk, but you can tell that he's like, uh, he, he, he's making his rounds, trying to get as much eye contact as possible with everybody versus other people. They're a little more selective. So it's like, I feel like I can trust them a little bit better. So those are just a couple right off the bat. Let me present you with a couple of scenarios. 
let's say a boat shows up to your camp. We're in the pre-merge. You're hanging out with your tribe. A guy gets off the boat and says, okay, as a tribe, you got to pick one person to go on a journey. Now, you know, these could be good things. There could be bad things that come with this. What is your strategy? Are you volunteering? Are you going to try to get someone else to go? How are you approaching that? Oh, man. I think that's a case-by-case basis. I can see a lot of different outcomes. I could definitely volunteer in the sense that, like, I feel in the early game is when players like me have the most power in the sense that we are least likely to be voted off really early in the game. So making big moves early on to maybe, like, pad myself, give myself a little protection when the merge starts coming – I could see myself doing that. I think for the most part, I'd want to, you know, send out one of my closest allies. So keep the target a little bit off me, but keep it close enough where they'll tell me whatever they get kind of thing. And, you know, drawing rocks, that's worst comes to worst, but still a fine outcome, I think. Outside of even the journey stuff, how are you planning to handle like the advantage game of it all? Especially, you know, you're just coming off a season, right? Where you're seeing like, oh, your idol that you find might might not even be real. How eager will you be to hunt for things in the jungle while you're trying to play the rest of Survivor? Oh my gosh. Yeah, the advantages and the idols of this modern day Survivor are both like terrifying, but also extremely exciting. Because it's like, I feel like for strategists, people who are able to play a fluid game, like these advantages that come in, if you're able to make the pivots in time, like it could be a benefit for your game. Um, But... I think my strategy in terms of advantages, I really want to go into the merge with some sort of advantage, some sort of safety, because I know once we clash together, it's like, you know, there might be a a tribe where two people go off. We are split into two groups and like one from each of them go off. And like when that happens, you know, you've seen it in past recent seasons, the big guys like me, they get picked off. So having any sort of protection during those moments, I think would be really, really helpful for me. And I'll definitely be trying to find some stuff. Give me your greatest superpower and your greatest piece of kryptonite in life and how that might apply to the game. Man, greatest superpower and greatest kryptonite. I think superpower, going back to just like living that whole kind of chameleon thing, a bunch of different lifestyles, I think I am a lot more sensitive and empathetic for someone who might look like me and like big and strong and stuff. Like, you know, you might think of me as like a surfer bro or a meathead. You might not know just how sensitive I am. At the same time, I feel like that's also a kryptonite for the game because it's Mm -hmm. like the one thing I'm really nervous about is sort of getting actually genuinely really connected with people and then having to cut them off. I already thought about like, you know, if my tribe loses first immunity and like we have to vote someone off, that's going to be a heartbreaker sending someone home for the first time. And it's just like, that's something I, I don't think I can really be prepared for. I just have to be ready to suck it up when the time comes. And I hope I can. I think I can, but we'll see. What is your hottest survivor take? What do you think is your most controversial opinion about a season, the show, a player, et cetera? Ooh, okay. Um, I think Philip Shepard is an A-tier player. I love Ooh. Philip Shepard. He's awesome. And uh, I would have loved to play with him, but... You know, I know he's not everybody's cup of tea. You're not just jockeying for a nickname, are you? That you're going to come out and you're going to be called the chameleon from him? Okay. I also would love a nickname. Like, that's something on my survivor bucket list that I can't get unless I play with him. So, Philip, please, let's play together. Let's do this. <laughs> oh, well, last thing, and maybe this will segue to what you just answered. If you could bring a celebrity or a fictional character out as your loved one for a loved one's visit, who would it be and why? It plays a little, but it's not Philip. It's actually Coach. One of the, you know, Coach is above Philip, I think. Like, the Dragon Slayer, like, my first and, like, favorite character of all time. Like, I love him. Pure comedy. I think it would be a kind of a pain to work with him, but having him come over for a little bit, give me a little coaching advice, I think that would be pretty awesome. At worst comes to worst, it'll be a good laugh and something to, you know, tell stories about because he truly is, like, the biggest legend in my mind. Would you accept the title of assistant coach? Would you let him stretch oh. you out to get you ready for the latter portion of the game? I I would do anything for the, I would take the title of assistant coach over a name by Philip Shepard. Yeah, I, oh. I like, that would be amazing. And like, All right. you know, I would share that with Tyson. I'm fine. Like, I would love to be coach of the assistant coach. That would be awesome. All right. Well, man, listen, I'm ready for you to slay over these next 26 days. I, I'm so pumped for you. It seems like you really just have a great sense of things, positivity, yet like (laughs) self-introspection. And I really hope it turns out well for you at the end of the day. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. I'm really looking forward to what comes next for you. Thank you so much. It's 
truly an honor. My mom is going to be so happy for that shout out you gave her earlier. It's going to make her day. She's going to save this, download it, I'm sure. So thank you again. Can't wait to uh, talk to you later. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm doing good. What's your name? I'm Mike Bloom. Uh, I'm with Parade slash Rob has a podcast trying to represent both. Uh, and who awesome. might I be talking with today? My name is Dee. I listen to your podcast at home. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, nice to, to meet you then to put the face nice to, to the name. You. Yes. <laughs> How are you doing right now? I'm thriving. I'm excited to start. <laughs> You're thriving. That's such an I'm interesting thriving. word. What, what is it? Is it just like, because I know you're from Florida. Is it just like the, the tropical weather? Is it the idea of the game? What makes you feel that mood right now? Honestly, a little bit of everything. I, I, do, I feel like I'm at home here. You know, it's the humidity, the palm trees, the water. I love being next to the ocean. Like to me, that's just, it's like a meditation. Like it's my form of meditation, working out and being next to the water. <laughs> so that's why I'm thriving. Yeah, I feel good here. So what is your career? I know you're an entrepreneur, but what do you specialize in? Yeah, so I like dabbled in a lot of different things. Like growing up, I went to school for psychology, um, but then I found out like they didn't make much money. So I'm like, I got to do something else. <laughs> and then um, I did retail sales my entire life. Then I went to pharmaceutical sales. Then I went into tech sales. And then I started my own business, my own backpack company, because I love to travel. So it's just like that niche, the travel community. <laughs> Now I am hearing sales a lot. Is that something you plan on bringing to the game that just natural ability to convince people to do what you want? Yeah, definitely. It's something that I don't plan on telling people that I've done in the past. Like, I'm just going to say that I have my backpack company because it is not a lie. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't want anyone to, anytime you hear the word sales or sell, like people just automatically turn off and I, I don't want that to happen. Um, but yeah, definitely. I think life in general, you're just selling yourself in every opportunity, right? So that's how I'm going to play the game. Just going to sell myself. <laughs> yeah. So what caused you to sit in front of me today? Why are you here on Survivor? Uh, <laughs> this is crazy. Um, I started watching Survivor in 2020. Like I can't say I started watching it from day number one. Well, obviously I wasn't born yet, but um I 2020 my best friend was like D you should watch the show you'd really like it I just started binge watching everything and I became a super fan I started then going back to the older episodes and I'm like oh this is who Boston Rob is this is who Sandra is and and then I just started watching everything I started just getting attached to be honest and like hmm. I, I remember like when I first saw the first season I was like I would cry I would literally cry when I would see the family visits because I just I knew I would be on Survivor before I knew I would be on Survivor, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. I just, I knew it innately. I, I felt it. And, and that's why I'm here. Cause I want to like, I want to take care of my family. First of all, I, obviously we all want to win the million dollars. So want my family to be taken care of. And I also want to inspire people to kind of like go out there and do, do things that scare them. And this scares me. Like if someone says this doesn't scare them, they're, they're lying. <laughs> So can you give me, because you've watched so much Survivor, you know, in the past few years, give me a Survivor winner and then give me a non-winner who you identify with the most. Great question. Survivor winner that I identify with. Let me think. Let me think. I love Sandra. She's Puerto mm. Rican. I'm Cuban. So she has a little hustle in her, a little feistiness in her. Um, she also has like, I don't give a shit attitude, which I love, <laughs> which I need to get, I need to get better at. So mm. looking at her, that, that thing about her, I'm like, damn, I want that. You know, I, I, I see that a little bit in me, but I have to like tweak it a little bit. Um, as far as non-winner, I'll say one of the most recent ones, Jesse. I love Jesse. I was rooting for Jesse. Like when he lost that fire, I was like, damn, that's so sad. <laughs> and I think um, I relate to him a lot because his reason why he came on the show to begin with, his wife and, and his, I don't know if it was a daughter. I think it was a daughter or son. I don't remember. But the reason why he was here on Survivor primarily is because of his family. And like throughout the show, you just watch him like be such you just watched him be himself, be just a cool dude, like very normal, chill, cool dude. And you can tell like every episode, like his family was in mind and that's how I'm going to go into the game. And that's why I feel like I relate to both of them in those ways. Hmm. So I know you mentioned the family visit before. Is that your favorite moment in Survivor history? Do you have another favorite moment? Yes. Oh my God, of course. Family visit to me is number one. I feel like 
it's one thing to watch the show and it's another thing to be like sitting here getting interviewed by you and like everyone and it just honestly it feels surreal and to to imagine one of my family members coming it just like man and and for my parents like they left everything behind in Cuba to bring my brother and I into the the United States for a better future it's like wow man this is like the moment you know like this is why you guys left everything the familiarity of their culture their language like everything like no money they came to the United States not knowing English had to hustle multiple jobs just to have plate of food on the table for my brother and I and like you know my brother and I are so grateful for that and it just feels like I'm giving back to them in a sense you know and like yeah. I know that they're proud of me no matter what but just for them to like travel to Fiji in itself is like mom you're here in Fiji <laughs> That is amazing. What is your prep been like? So initially when, when I got the email back of like, Hey, send in your submission. I started prepping right then and there. I did not wait nice. for them to tell me you're in. I was like, I'm in already. Like I got the email. I'm going to do my best in every interview and I'm going to go on survivor. Um, but luckily my prep physically, I it's a lifestyle. Like I, I love to do CrossFit and I love to work out and just be in the outdoors. We don't have mountains in Miami, obviously. So <laughs> I'll just like, you know, I'll do CrossFit, wake surf. I just do anything that skate like skates. So physically it's been a lifestyle already, but I think my, my prep has been more mental than anything else. Obviously I've prepped for fires. Like I never started a fire before in my life, <laughs> but I, I know how to do that now. I did not prep for fishing because I'm like, eh, somebody's going to know how to fish. And obviously survival instincts will kick in. I'll, I'll learn then. <laughs> I like the smell of fish anyway. Um, but I think more than anything else, it's just been mental. I've been like researching. Rob has a podcast. Every podcast on Spotify I've listened to. I've also listened to a lot of winners um, interviews and, and kind of like learning from their mistakes. I feel like mm. obviously it's been 23 years of Survivor. Somebody, the people that have played are the people that have the best advice, right? The people that have already been through what I'm about to go through. So that's been my biggest prep. Yeah, that's incredibly valid. What is one life experience you feel like has prepared you most for what you're about to jump feet first into? Man, it's hard to say one life experience, obviously, because Survivor, <laughs> you bring in so many life experiences, but I'll right. definitely say uh, starting my business with my business partner um, three years ago, it's prepared me because we, first of all, I've learned a lot about myself and how to be a better business partner and, and how I say things, how I approach things, what, what I like in somebody else to, to tell me how to do things or just kind of like you always, when you're in a partnership, you gotta like be on the same page all the time, right? You have to have the same vision, be on the same page, and then you can have disagreements. It's taught me how to like learn to not take things personally. Like nothing is ever personal. People don't do things as like a screw you rather of more like a pro me, you know, I have not take things personally. And I've just learned how to connect with people. I feel like I've already had that innately, but just learning how to sell this, this, this backpack that we have, how can we sell this to people? How can we use our story, you know, our, mm. the story to, to, to get it out there and sell. And, and once we do sell it, how can we make them appreciate the fact that they spent their hard earned, hard earned money in, in our product, you know, like, so it's a lot of little things, but I, I would say that definitely prepared me to be here on Survivor. Yeah. You talk about business partners when it comes to Alliance partners, are you seeking like similar characteristics that you do in your business partner? Are you looking for different things? What do you seek out in hopefully a number one or ride or die? You're such a great interviewer. I love your oh, question. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be your wow. number one now with that amount of flattery. Oh, let's do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> funny. Um, I would definitely say I gravitate towards people that I feel that are just authentically themselves and, and are honest. Um, I've said it before, like you don't get far in this game by yourself. You, you need alliance partners. And I want someone who I, who stays true to their word. And I know it's like hard to say, cause we're on survivor and you're not always going to stay true to your word, but someone that in the beginning stages stays true to their word to get you to a certain point. And then once that happens, we'll cross the line then, but someone that I can like, I can read, obviously, if there's someone that's like too erratic and obviously like always like here and there and just running around like I can't trust someone like that because obviously I can't read them so 
Yeah. <laughs> well, now let's flip the reading back onto you. How do you think people are yeah. going to perceive you in this game? I think um, being from Miami, I think people will perceive me as like, like this prissy, like pretty face, doesn't like to get dirty or just kind of like, like to party maybe since like when you first hear Miami, that's the first thing you think about. Don't get me wrong. I do like to party sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> like to <have> fun. <laughs> um, but I think that they'll be, they'll be shocked by like how much substance I can bring. And like, just cause I'm from like a city that everyone knows and not all the rappers rap about, like, I'm really not like that, that like stereotype of like Miami women, um, which whatever that stereotype is like good for you. Like nobody cares. Right. But yeah, I think people will perceive me as like someone that just doesn't get dirty, <laughs> but I don't care. I'm not here. I'm not here to, to be clean. I'm not here to look pretty. I'm here to win the million dollars. When it comes to perceptions, the people you're yeah. looking around at right now, right? Your competition, your friends and enemies for the next 26 days, just based off first impressions, is there anyone you're eyeballing as like, that's someone I want to work with if we draw the same buff? Or is there anyone that you're like, giant red flag, cannot work with them if I'm next to them? Yeah, um, the I said this before, but the the person that obviously stands out is Bruce because he's back. So it makes me think like, all right, he's likable. He They asked him to come back for a reason, right? So it makes me think like, all right, what is that reason? Like, I want to get to know him. And he also has a calming presence about him. Like, he reminds me a lot of my dad. I, I turned Bruce into my uncle and he doesn't even know it yet. <laughs> um, so I definitely say Bruce is one of them. Um, I also like... Um, the the dude with like the long hair and he has like his button down open I don't know if he has it open in the interviews but mm. he seems like such a funny guy that I can relate to even though like obviously we haven't spoken but I don't know he just seems like a laid-back dude who doesn't care about much um and then someone that stands out to me as someone that is a red flag let me say <laughs> I feel bad <laughs> but let's see um I would definitely say the the tall, skinny white guy, um, the tallest person here. But mm. I, I don't say it because of my perception of him. I think it's more of like the energy that I got from him because he still hasn't like looked me directly in the eyes. <laughs> that might be a hype thing. <laughs> no, I swear. I've, I've tried. I've tried. I've been like, mm, I've been, look at me. <laughs> And I, I don't think he does it to me. Um, it's not personal. I, he doesn't do it just to me. I think he's like that. I've like kind of looked at around and he doesn't make eye contact with anyone. But, you know, I, I for me, I think those are the people you need to watch out for because they like they're so introverted that it's hard to like get things out of them. And mm -hmm. yeah, and like you never know what their next move will be. So those are the people that like the people that are just not as like you can. I don't know if they're not having fun or they're just nervous, but kind of let that go. <laughs> let me put a scenario in front of you. So let's say you're on, you're on your tribe, you're on the beach, a boat pulls up and says, yeah. you got to pick one person to go on a journey. Are you volunteering for it? Are you trying to throw someone? Because we've seen, you know, the positives and negatives that come with it. How are you handling that situation? Yeah. I think in the beginning, I will not volunteer um, because the beginning stages, they're so crucial in your game. Like you need to be around people because it's obvious. We know what happens then. Um, I won't throw anyone under the bus because that puts a target on my back. I, I would never want to throw anyone under the bus and have them feel resentment towards me. And that might be the only thing that they say, like, I want to get her out because she feels like I couldn't, she couldn't have me here. Um, I will not volunteer. I would step back and let someone else lead in that moment. Like, I, I, I can date back to elementary where I remember we would get lined up to be like line leaders, but it was like alphabetically. And I was always in the back of the line because my last name started with a V. Right. And I remember back then I'd be like, damn, why am I in the back of the line? I want to be a line leader. Um, but, and, and I, I see myself as a leader, but I also see in moments like that, it's okay to step back and let somebody else lead. So in that moment, I, I will not uh, I won't go to the island, not at first. <laughs> what about advantages in general? Uh, even if they're outside of the journey, are you hunting for them? Are you seeking them out? Yeah, definitely. I'm definitely going to hunt and seek them out. I think you have to take risks in Survivor, whether it's in the beginning or at the end. And for advantage advantages for me, I'll be a little bit more uh, risk because I'll still 
I can keep that to myself. You know, I, I going to another island, I can't keep that to myself. Everyone knows I'm going to the other island and then they know that I may come back lying. Um, but advantages, I can find it and I can keep it to myself. And that I'm, I'm okay risking, uh, risking that and going out and searching for that. That's fun. Last thing I want to ask. So you talked about yes. how much you love the loved one's visit. I'm going to put you in one right now, but okay. your loved one has to be either a celebrity or a fictional character. Who would you pick and why? Okay. Let's go with a celebrity. I would pick Dwayne Johnson. The I Rock. think he's such yeah, The Rock. Oh, I love him. I grew up watching like WWE with my brother. So I've known him for like years since I was like so little. Um, my brother would like press land me onto his bed. <laughs> but I'd pick The Rock because <laughs> he's such like he's one of like the big, like the top tier celebrities, and he's so humble, like. There's something about The Rock that people are just gravitated towards. And like, you'll see him doing videos all the time where he meets like fans and he's like telling them, hey, and like, you know, he walks into the room and like he dominates with his presence, obviously, because he's like six something and big as hell. But yeah, I just I love him. I think he he does a lot for the community. And you can tell he 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 is such a family man. And yeah, I would love to meet The Rock. That'd be so cool. I would love to give him a hug and be like all small next to him. Like, oh. I love you. And hopefully not get the people's <laughs> elbow. Hopefully not get choke slammed in the yeah. process. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How you doing, man? Nice I'm meeting you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you too. Listen, you know, it's a familiar voice. I, I usually, you know, imbibe the podcast in audio form, but it, it's great to be among one of the greats, the great uh, Survivor Media personas. Yes, I'm uglier in person, I know, but we'll all try to deal with it one step at a time. Well, g give me your deeds, man. Give me the bio line. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Uh, so I kind of, I, I, you know, I'm a very open about who I am. It's all on the front cover. My name is Drew Basile. I'm 22 years old from Birmingham, Michigan. Uh, I'm a student at the University of Pennsylvania. This is my last semester wrapping up here. Uh, I've, I love the show. I started watching Philippines 25, really Caramoan 26. Cochran was a major inspiration for me. I'm sure, per, sure you and other people will draw the you know, comparison. Um, but if I started out Cochran, I've really made moves to build myself more into somebody who is charismatic, personable, um, all, all of that. Yeah. What are you about to receive your degree in? So at UPenn, which is an Ivy, it's not Harvard, you know, but it, it's an Ivy. I study English and philosophy. So I'm in the books. I'm in the library. I don't get out much to the gym, for example. Um, but what I do work on is like really dense stuff. I'm talking like modernist, epic, you know, door stoppers, Kant, Hegel, things like that. So it's not like it's not the easy A humanities. Like it's real, like rigorous logical work. Um, and so I think that kind of analytical framework for like remembering all of these details and historical comparisons and like, how do things change? I do think that way of thinking that schematic, you know, kind of uh, cognition is something that a lot of people might not have practiced and that could help me out in a game like Survivor, where there are so many moving pieces, so many variables, so many uh, things that change in time. So yeah, 100%. So that being said, not only, I guess, while yeah. I ask, you know, why Survivor, but why Survivor now? Because you're you're in your last semester of college, you know, and we certainly have seen people in school come on to these shows and do well in various capacities. What made you feel like now was the good time to do the show for you? This now is when they gave me the call, you know, and anytime they called, I would come to be clear. But now is an interesting time because I actually had to defer my graduation to be here, huh. right? I had to drop class. I'm going to do stuff in the summer. Hopefully we'll be on time, relatively speaking. But in a more broad, you know, scope, right now is an excellent time to play Survivor because it is a pivot. It is a hinge. It is a hinge between my academic career, which I, even though you're an adult in college, I still consider it basically childhood, and the rest, you know, career, family, old age, demise. So, I've, I've spent a lot of time building myself during this, you know, educational stage in, in, a, in, in a lot of senses. And I want to test that. I want to see where I'm at. I want to, you know, knock on the door, see what the foundation looks like. And I hope that that would kind of give me the pivot, the push to go and then have an amazing, amazing 60, you know, odd years to come. Well, you invoked a couple names before, so I'm intrigued that when I ask you, you know, give me a survivor winner and a non-winner that you identify with. Are you including those names or do you have other ones in mind? Uh, I mean, once upon a time, Cochran would have been the one. 
Um, but I do think maybe I've outgrown that a little bit. Maybe I'm a little bit more personable and than 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 at middle school, which was really the dark ages. It was a medieval period that I, I that I neglect from the history books. Um, but I think now, if you were gonna, if you were gonna pigeonhole me today, I'd be like somebody like Ryan Ulrich, maybe uh, maybe a guy like Jonathan Penner, maybe even the hallowed, the great Rob Sesternino. Uh, I'm a fast talker, a bit of a wit. Um, I'm very authentic, and I I can have some rough edges. Mm. What's your favorite moment in the history of Survivor? Is it connected to one of the people you just invoked? Uh, I mean, if so, tangentially. I got a couple. I've been thinking about this. I've been waiting for somebody to ask me this. You're the first one. Uh, my favorite strategic play is probably the Three Amigos uh, idol, you know, hold up in, uh, in Caramoa. That's an epic moment. I, I like the um, minority vote split in uh, David versus Goliath. Mm -hmm. But I do have a soft spot for some of kind of like the adventurous moments of, of, of days yore. So like Guatemala, when they have the huge trek, that first episode, nobody even talks about that or, or Vanuatu when like Chad gets drunk on Kava and they like go to a volcano, like that stuff always, always stuck with me, you know? And so the, I would say those are my favorite moments, but yeah. Mm. So how have you been preparing for this experience? Because like you said, you know, you talk about this pivot in your life. Absolutely. I'm sure that does. Yeah, I'm sure that that hampers, though, the 24 hours you have in a day to also prepare for a survivor. So what's oh. the process been like for you in like the months leading up to this? Yeah, and I, I'll give you a little bit more of like a pragmatic answer on this one than maybe you're asking for. But but I was watching season 44 and I'm watching Carson do these puzzles and he's got them all 3D printed. And I'm like, oh, my God, like I'm an idiot. Like, why? why I don't have time. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's too late. But um, like, duh. Um, but no, no, no. I was super busy on the lead up because obviously I had to finish all of my coursework to get here. So like write all the papers, all the thesis and stuff. Um, I did, however, have time to teach myself to swim. Uh, and I, I got reasonably good at it. I hope you won't see me drown. Um, I did practice some of the more common puzzles, uh, my, my slide puzzles down pat, things like that. And I did some cardio, did some running. So listen, you know, Mike, you are not going to get the, uh, you're not going to get Adonis out there. I'm not going to be an Olympian, but I, I hope I'll hang in it. And I have put some prep work in to do so. What is one life experience you feel like has prepared you most for the game? See, this is this one. This is like such a ripe opportunity to brag and like say like something fun. But I'll be honest, which is that uh, during COVID, I moved back to Philly to be uh, with my girlfriend and like I needed a job and I needed a job that had flexible hours. And so I got a job at a call center and I worked at the call center for about a year and a half total. And the call center was very different because in my day-to-day -day school life, I'm, you know, hobnobbing with the rich and famous. You know, these kids, it's a lot of money, you know, rich, luxurious lifestyles. But then at the call center, like you're calling people who are just coming back from work, you know, people who are yeah. a little bit more in touch with the real world. And you got to not only talk to them, but you got to talk to them quick. Like you have to be authentic, like in their will within 10 seconds. So uh, that's tough. And I think that that kind of, uh, that split helped, is going to help me out. Yeah. So that being said, I mean, you have worked in so many different environments to your point, but how do you think people in this game will perceive you once you step foot on that beach? What do you expect people to see from you? Yeah, well, I mean, it's very tempting to just like give me the once over and be like, oh, Napoleon Dynamite, you know, and I do have my clumsy moments, to be honest with you. Um, I think very quickly, though, people are going to, you know, suss out that there's a little more going on, uh, that he is like a social threat to some degree, that he is certainly a strategic threat. He's a smart guy. And, you know, perhaps it's for my ego, but I'm going to roll with that. You know, I don't intend to, to, to play things down. Like I'm going to show people huh. who I am. And I think that quickly they will they say, okay, this is a guy who needs to be taken seriously and who I should work with. Interesting. And what's the tactic behind that choice? Because, you know, nine out of 10 survivor players, you'd ask this question. They're like, oh yeah, I'm definitely going to play up that stereotype. But you're like, no, nope, uh, tell me I'm smart. Tell me I'm wily. Mike, the, 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 the rationale behind this is a symbolic rationale, which is that we've had the big moves era in the 30s, and now we have the little moves era in the 40s. And it's like, stay underwater until like you can submerge at the very end. I have so much respect for Survivor. I do. Like, it's, it's an honorable, like almost game of epic proportion. And so I want to go out there and play the game that it deserves. Now, this is, to be clear, this is not like flame out day one looking for an idol, but you know, I'm, I'm going to play it like a game of like a game of chess. And in chess, mm -hmm. you don't like hide all your pieces in the corner. You don't hide them all until the end game. And then like, you know, send a couple out. You it's, it's a, it's a full fledged thing. So when it comes to the people you're playing against, 
what are you seeking in an alliance partner? Any specific characteristics you want in a ride or die? Yeah, okay, ride or die. I'm glad you said that because I very much am looking for a ride or die. Again, I think an impression people might have of me, maybe you do, maybe my you know competitors or allies will, is that like I'm slimy. I wanna, I wanna play people. I do not. Like I come from a house that really valued loyalty. And you don't have to be loyal to everyone, but you got to be loyal to that core group. And so I am looking for a core group who I can be lockstep with, um, people who I can like tally up with to the end of the game. Maybe it's only one or two, but that is what I'm looking for. That being said, I'm young. My hope is that I can find someone who can bring me a little age, a little wisdom, and also find somebody who can um, bring some physicality that I'm lacking. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. sure that you can, you know, put the pieces together with who you've talked to, who I might have in mind, but yeah. No, yeah, let, let, let's uh, elaborate on that because obviously, you know, you've, I wouldn't say have been studying people, but like you've I've been certainly, I'm sure oh, making yeah, I, I had the binoculars out. I'm like, it's like a sting operation. We like follow, take notes, take notes, you know. Yeah, um, uh, who, who's your mark right now? Like describe to me some of these people that from either direction, either ones that you're like, okay, if we draw the same buff, best case scenario. And then maybe some people you can describe for me that you're like, big red flag. I'm running down your name okay. as soon as possible. Well, listen, man, number one, I, I, I think it's Bruce. I'm like pretty much 100% because it's BP, he's wearing Boston stuff, but I, I'm horrible with faces. Like I literally, I can't do faces. Like I, I don't know, they just don't click for me. So I can never be hundred percent, but I think it's Bruce. And if it is, that's the guy. Like I want to work with him. I know he's a straight shooter. He's got a, like um, background, exactly what I'm looking for. Um, additionally to him, uh, I'd love to work with the guy you just talked with, like super buff, long hair, um, long hair, Asian guy, uh, young, he seems like a seems like a dependable guy who is going to bring that strength that I'm looking for. Uh, but yeah, I'll tell you, I look at this cast. I don't see many people I don't like. Um, somebody who intimidates me maybe a little bit is like the the um, he's kind of like a beefy, I think like Boston firefighter type dude. Um, I look at him and think that maybe he's not going to you know pick up what I put down. So let me present some scenarios to you here. Yeah, pre merge. All right, I'm ready. There we go. You're in the, you're in mode right now. You're hanging out, oh, pre-merge, man. hanging out with your tribe on the beach. Boat pulls up. Guy steps off. The tribe has to send a person to go on a journey. Now, you and I both know that, like, these things come with good and bad things. What's, your, ta- what's your tactic to approach this? Are you volunteering? Are you going to try to will someone else to do it? How are you approaching this scenario? So I tend to find that the, the, the rewards for going in this journey uh, become a little more enticing after the first one, like the first one is like little things like the steal a vote, the bank a vote, you know, but I, I want, I want the whole vote. I want the immunity idol, the vote, the steal, whatever. Um, so I might, I might play it cautiously on that first go, but after that, I want to go. I want the experience. I want the idol. I'm a firm believer that, that you really cannot navigate um, the, the middle game and the early game of the new era survivor without an advantage of some kind. Um but, but I think that some of the new advantages have been a little underused. So like, remind me, Mike, what is the one where you, you play it and then um, you get all the uh, idols that were played? Oh, in the yeah. Tribal Council? What's that the, called? The inheritance advantage, man. Rest in peace. The inheritance advantage. Well, my thought process is like the inheritance advantage. If I have an idol and the inheritance advantage, I can play both and then I can recoup my idol. You know, yeah. that, what, what a rich strategic potential that has. And so these are the kind of things I'd like to do. And that's why I'm going to be, you know, aggressive in seeking these advantages. What is your hottest survivor take? What do you think is your most controversial opinion on like a season uh, or a player or the show proper? Well, I, I can tell you my favorite survivor player, which is going to be really controversial. People won't believe it, but my favorite is definitely Brad Culpepper. I'm a, I'm a Culpepper fanatic, but that's uh, that's definitely a controversial take. I really love the guy though. Um, I think there are some, some seasons that don't get some love. Like again, you know, Vanuatu, Guatemala, um, which I mentioned already, that are great. And uh, that, that should be a little high, more highly heralded. Well, last thing I'm going to ask, and you know what I'm going to end yeah. with, if you could pick a no cele- celebrity or a fictional <laughs> character to come out right. for a loved one's visit, who are okay. you picking and why? So this is a tough question because it's like, are they just like coming for the visit? Or are they like my loved ones? You know what I mean? I mean, I would imagine like uh, in this scenario, they'd like 
know of you, I suppose. You can make it this whatever you want to. You're your okay, Frenchman right. fantasy here. I might I would choose like maybe somebody interesting to have a conversation with. So like a philosopher. Like maybe I'd be like, you bring me Aristotle. Maybe I'd do like Batman. I don't know, because he's got like two things going on. He's rich too. Maybe if we're friends, he'll help me out. What a spectrum. Uh, Aristotle and Batman. They both yeah, yeah, yeah. they both have, you know, caves associated with them. So I guess they are sort of two sides of the same coin. <laughs> Oh, that was that was pretty good. That was I gotta I gotta work on my my that was nice, Mike. I like that. Hi, how's it going? Hello, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I wasn't I, anticipating to walk in and have a computer be in the room. I kind of this is great. It reminds me of old life in a little small way. I was gonna say, were you <laughs> expecting me to be like sitting at a table waiting for you or were you just expecting nothing? <laughs> I think I was expecting nothing. I think that's generally how I feel about this entire process is just walk into rooms, see what happens. You know, pregame is a lot of, it's a lot of go there and then you find out in yeah. the moment. <laughs> a lot of hurry up and wait. Well, I am Mike. Nice, <laughs> ni nice to meet you. Uh, give me, give me your, your bio line. Give me your name, where you're from, what you do. Absolutely. I am Jay. Um, Jay is short for my full artist name, which is Jay Maya. I'm 24. I'm from San Francisco, California originally, but I'm based now in Los Angeles, California, and I'm a singer songwriter. Yeah. So talk to me about this because I, I saw a little bit of it in the blurb that I was given ahead of time because, yes. uh, I mean, you grew up as a, I'm sure with a song in your heart, but this was something you haven't pursued <laughs> your entire life, right? Talk to me about this journey. 100%. So Growing up, I think I internalized a lot of the pressure from my community and family to pursue a very traditional path. So I'm Indian American. My parents both immigrated to this country late in their lives, and they had this dream that one of their children would attend what they perceived to be the most prestigious institution, which is in their minds, Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. I think genuinely part of it comes from having watched Legally Blonde. Um, <laughs> I was about to say. Enough, I get it. It's a phenomenal film. Um, but, you know, I think growing up, I looked at my parents and I was like, they've sacrificed so much for me to even be here that I want to help make their dreams come true in addition to, you know, just being a good daughter. And I decided that it was my one track mission that I was going to get into Harvard Law School. And that's been my life goal since I was like eight years old. And I did everything exactly right, even though I've always been a really creative person and I naturally gravitated toward writing, I channeled all of that into debate. So in high school, I was a debater and I ended up getting into Harvard. And at Harvard, I traveled around the world doing collegiate debate. I won a ton of awards and I actually ended up getting accepted early to Harvard Law School when I was a junior in college still. And it was alarm, alarm bells rung because I think I just realized in that moment of getting accepted that this was supposed to be like the happiest moment of my life. And I was miserable because I just, I didn't want to go to law school. And I felt mm. like it made it real for me, but I decided that I couldn't just immediately abruptly give it up because so many, it meant so much to so many people. So what I started to do is I started in my senior year of college and then in the pandemic, I started uploading acoustic demos of songs that I had written to TikTok under an anonymous name. J Maya, which is not my real name. <laughs> and one of the songs one day went viral. No one in my life knew that I wrote songs. So not a single friend, not a parent, not a family member, not a previous boyfriend. It was something I kept completely secret. But somehow I found the courage to tell my parents, A, I'm not going to law school. B, I write songs. C, one of said songs went viral. And D, I'm moving to LA and I'm going to be a professional full-time singer-songwriter. And here we are two years later and I've I've kind of made it happen somehow. <laughs> now, let's move on to the next verse of that song, which is the survivor of it all, right? Because yes, that's the survivor a, of it all. <laughs> I, I mean, that's a big move in and of itself. And you are about to enter a game full of them in a very different way. So what brought you to explore this new experience after making such a shift into a new experience only a couple of years ago? Oh my gosh, absolutely. I love this question because to me, Survivor is a microcosm of life experience. And for, for me, you know, going through this experience a couple of years ago of having to make this crossroads decision, one, 
road being extremely safe, one that I knew well, one that I was prepared for, and then the other road being a complete unknown, starting from scratch, essentially coming into the music industry with no experience and no connections and knowing nothing about what I was supposed to do, but a road that was still somehow so enticing, making that decision and having it turn out well was a big life lesson for me because I think I realized that you get no reward without risk taking. And it sets me up, I think, well for a game where you ultimately do have to make bold moves if you want to be rewarded. And so I think that's part of it is just learning through experience how valuable it can be to take big, bold risks in your life. And then another piece of this whole puzzle to me is that a big part of who I am is, you know, you know, we're all kind of searching for the inner child amidst all of the chaos of our lives, right? And for me, I grew up someone who had their head in a book 24 seven. And for me, reading has always been like a huge escape. The music I write actually, funnily enough, people call it nerd pop because I talk so much about books and crossword puzzles and language and puns in it. It's just who I am. And growing up, I didn't have a lot of friends because I was a bit of an outsider. I grew up in a really white town and I'm mm. myself Indian American. And reading was an escape for me. And the books that I would gravitate toward more than any other were adventure novels and fantasy novels, They'd like stories of kids going on big quests to save the world. And I just grew up with this dream in my heart that, you know, however ludicrous it sounded, one day I would get to go on a quest like that of my own. But then you realize, okay, like life, life isn't like that. Quests don't really exist until I came across Survivor. And I was like, this is, this is as close to a big adventure that you can get in one's lifetime, I think. And from then on, it just kind of imprinted in my brain. I was like, this is, this is the way to make my inner child proud. I have no idea if like, this is an experience that is so new to me. I'm stepping into it. I don't have any experience in this world, but the thrill of it all is like how unknown it is, what a challenge it is, you know? Yeah. So how does this incorporate into like your history with Survivor? Is this something you've always been watching? I'm assuming that also fed into your sort of kid-like fantasies of going on this big jungle adventure. <laughs> yeah, I would say Survivor was on when I was growing up because my parents watched it. And for me, you know, I was pretty insulated. Even as a kid, I grew up in America. I was born and raised here. But, you know, I grew up in a really strict Indian household and I didn't get a lot of insight as to like what traditional American media was, you know what I mean, <laughs> in my home. And so Survivor was just kind of one of those shows that was on growing up. And I just saw it and I was like, this is this is the coolest thing ever. This is American media at its finest. But the truth is I didn't have a lot of other things to compare it to. And, and you know what? Now that I do, it still is phenomenal television. So I stand by that. But I will say I, I came into Survivor personally, like in my own life, I would say two or three years ago. You know, it's always mm. been in my peripheral vision. But it, was, it wasn't until the pandemic that I really started getting into it because I would watch it on Netflix. And I truly believe, I believe that things happen for a reason. I'm a really proud Hindu. It's, it's a big part of who I am. And we really do believe in the universe and karmic energy. I believe that Survivor came into my life at a time when it needed to, because that was right at the cusp of me making my big decision, taking my big adventure to leave what I knew to be true and pursue an adventure on, you know, the other side of the country. And for me, I think it all is so full circle because it makes sense that it came into my life at that time. And now that I'm on the other side of that big decision to be on the show, it feels, yeah, it feels really full circle to me. If you could give me one Survivor winner, and one non-winner that you associate oh. yourself with, either personally, strategically, what have you, who are you picking? Oh my gosh. Oh no, both of the people I want to say have won, have won seasons, but one lost a season I, I, before. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. I'll let that count. <laughs> I love that. Okay. Well, my, my quasi loser is Parvati. <laughs> and a reason that I, a re reason that I give for Parvati, which is so funny to me is that um, I don't know how I don't know how many people know this, but the name Par Parvati comes from Hinduism. It's the name yeah. of a really powerful Hindu goddess, and I am also named after a very powerful Hindu goddess. <laughs> so I feel a soul connection with her. But no, seriously, I think she was one of the players I watched early on that really represented to me what it means to wield others' perception of you to your advantage. Like I think, especially in her first season, she 
had this reputation for being a flirt maybe and being bubbly and fun. And I think people tend to discount women who show those traits because they mm. think that they don't have that strong ruthless edge in them hidden behind all of those layers of niceness and I think I just saw in her from the first moment that she's a really complex woman and brilliant because she was able to leverage other people's perception of her to her advantage and craft this really strategic game around it so she's someone I've always really looked up to and admired and I would say a winner okay I'm gonna be horrible and give you two quick winners because I can't pick between the first is Marianne, because similarly, I think Marianne is a genius at leveraging other people's perception of her, having a good read as to where she stands in the game, having the self-awareness to understand how people see her, and then brilliantly using it to her advantage. I think I love her, you know, final tribal performance mm. more than any that I've seen, because you see how methodical she's been from the beginning and you see people's reactions as they learn that she's been this strategic mastermind the whole time I think it's just so satisfying to watch that she's so good at what she does and then just you know because she she was a big role model to me growing up Natalie I just Mm. it's so it's just awesome to see brown women on the screen rocking it like of course hell yeah exactly so she's a big she's a big inspo to me as well what do you think people are going to perceive you as? I mean, you come from the entertainment industry, right? Where like image is everything. Do you have a sense as to how 100%. these people might be viewing you? Yeah, I think I think people and and when I say when I think people will, I I also mean I hope people will, right? We'll see how it plays out, but um I think people will see me as, you know, a bubbly personality. It's something that I think I'll definitely try to get across. I think I have a lot of facets to who I am and they're all valid because we're all complex human beings. But I think um, I can be both very bubbly and social social, and also very introspective and thinking inwardly. And I think I'm going to try to bring out the first part of myself as much as possible because I think it throws people off guard a little bit in a good way. It doesn't it doesn't make them see you as someone who's scheming and plotting and potentially a threat. And I think I'm also going to play up the part of my personality that exists in the music industry, right? It is like big and bold and fun. Um, and then try to privately have those moments of reflection and, and thinking and, and thinking about where in the game I can fit myself. But I think it's going to be bubbly and hopefully fun. I'm also going to make a lot of puns. So I think people might get a little annoyed at some point about that. <laughs> well, I know one person who won't, so I'll be happy about it. I might, I might not be playing, but I'll be thrilled with it. Uh, I mean, when I you're, well, when you're looking around, let's say you're trying to form like the beach band, right? On a survivor, yes. you're looking around your competition <laughs> right now who are you eyeballing? Is there anybody that you're just making first impressions with of like, okay, if we draw the same buff, I want to work with them. On the other hand, is there anyone that you're like, major red flag, I'm writing their name down as soon as I get the chance to? Are you, are you making any judgments about these people around you? Oh my gosh, that's so hard because we haven't we haven't been talking to each other. So it's all based off of like glances and, mm-hmm. and you know, look at what people are reading and stuff. <laughs> total like covert operations well I'll say the obvious which is that Bruce is on our season which is very exciting and um I, I mean he was someone even before um he was medically evacuated on a season he was one of the first people I saw and was just like that person seems like he knows the game and he knows what's going on and um I think it would be awesome to get to work with Bruce at some point in the game um we'll see we'll see how that hands out but I will say I am a bit hesitant because I think he will be held in such high regard and high favor as he should be he's an amazing player and it's so awesome he gets the chance to come back and do this again it's just something to be wary of right like you don't want someone on your alliance who's too (laughs) too too crucial to the game otherwise you're going to be the first to go if your alliance is under fire so that's something I'm thinking about right now. And other than that, I would say that I'm, I love, you know, the energy of everyone that I've seen so far, but something that I'm definitely, you know, I'm planning to, and would love to do is just work with women. I think we've seen a trend in the last few, uh, in the last few seasons of young women going home very early. And I Mm -hmm. think it's hard that's due to the, the, three tribe structure and perceived tribe strength as it pertains to challenges. And I think it would be awesome to just come into my tribe and talk to the women and say, you know, it's, it's either us or them. So why don't we just band together, see how far we can make it as a crew and then figure it out from there. And I will also say that 
um, this group of people looks remarkably young. Like, I mm. think there are only a couple of people who are, who are, um, I would, I would say even not in their thirties. Um, I think everyone, it skews really young. I mean, I wouldn't even be shocked if the season had like a theme as, as it pertains to age. I have no idea, but I mean, that being said, I think I, I just, I, I relate a lot with young women. And so we'll see, we'll see if that happens naturally on the tribe and all the women, the energy seems great so far. So last thing I want to ask if you could bring a celebrity or a fictional character out there as your loved ones visit, who would it be and why? Are you going fellow musician or are you going in a different direction? I'm absolutely going the fictional character direction because that's an amazing question. And as a bookworm, I, I'm going to have to tie between two answers that just immediately spring to mind. The first is Katniss Everdeen from the Hunger Games mm-hmm. novels because who who better who better yeah. to help you with the strategy of the game to pinpoint who you should be allying with and I think yeah it should be great and then the other character is Annabeth Chase from the Percy Jackson series the Percy Jackson mm. series series that got me into reading I've been rereading it honestly here at pregame because I've been wanting to remind myself of the spirit of adventure that I was obsessed with as a kid in reading. So she's been on my mind a lot. And I think both of these characters are women who would just like rise to the challenge. I think it's something that I, it's something I know I'm going to struggle with coming into the game is just getting in my own head and not trusting my gut and my instinct, because I think I can be a bit of an anxious person. And I think both of those women would just tell me to snap out of it and like do what needs to be done. And I think I would appreciate that. (laughs) Amazing. Well, I hope you're able to capture that lightning in a bottle in a manner of speaking and be able to, you know, take it. Take it the full way, 26 days to the end. May the odds ever be in your favor. I should say this was so, this so, so great getting to chat with you, Jay. I really do wish you the best of luck. I know it's going to be an incredible experience. And no matter what, by the end of this, you're going to have a song to sing. And that's just going to be super fantastic. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. How are you Sorry today? Sorry to keep you waiting. Good, how are you? Please, I'm here for you. I'm here to serve. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Yeah, it's so nice to meet you. I'm Mike Bloom. I'm with Parade, with Rob Has a Podcast, etc. Who might I have the pleasure of speaking with today? My name is Julie Alley. Nice, Julie. Uh, what do you do for a living? Where are you from? I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm an attorney. Oh, fantastic. Oh, now I remember this, right? You are, uh, you are a bit later to becoming an attorney, right? You recently became a lawyer? <laughs> I am. I am. I started law school at the age of 40. So I finished in four years. It was night classes and passed the bar first time. And so I've been doing, I'm 49. So I've been doing it for five years now. Wow. Well, congratulations. What spurred it along? I'm I'm super intrigued because obviously you had led 40 years of life up to that point when major decides to make the major pivot. Um, Doesn't everybody start over then? No, I, (laughs) At 39, I found myself in the divorce attorney's office and I was in mediation. Well, I went to walk in and I waited forever. And then somebody came out and said, are you Julie Alley? And I said, yeah. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. We thought you were the new associate in the office. Come right this way. And I went, I'm almost 40. Why does she think I'm the new... So I go through mediation, which is grueling and terrible. And, uh, but all I'm doing is this is my new life. This is my, this is what I'm going to do. Cause I had two kids. They're in middle school at that point. And so I remember I called my mom cause she was watching my kids and she was like, how's mediation going? And I was like, screw mediation. I'm going to be an attorney. And she went, yes, you are. And I was like, yeah, I am. So honestly, cause it was that point when I was like, my life is either over or why not start it over? So I did it. I immediately took the test to get into law school and I did it. So I graduated law school within a week of my daughter graduating high school. Wow. We got to have ribbon gown pictures. It was very great. I hope there was a joint graduation party. I'm sure your daughter yes. loved that. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. She she had her own, but she came to mine. <laughs> so that being said, you know, you obviously have the capacity to make changes and moves in your life so what made you decide that this would be yet another move to make all the way to Fiji why survivor for you so another also 
extremely important part is that like my first year of law school, I'm teaching art classes during the day. I'm doing law school at night. Um, I'm raising two kids. It was, it was busy. It was busy, but I like things busy. Like I go, go, go. But I was ironing something. I turned on the TV, which I didn't watch that often. I didn't have much time for that. Mm -hmm. But 2015 Second Chance Cambodia was on. But yeah, back then. And I watch it and I'm like, what am I watching? what is going on? Like, why is Fishback obsessed with Joe? Who are these people? What's going on? Like, I was sucked in. I was like, and it was this big old school versus new school thing going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a great season. Amazing. So I'm watching it and I went, I want to be on the show. Like that was back 2015 because I was like, but it was also all those survivors were getting a second chance right? They were all like, we're coming back. And I was, and it was like my second chance at life. That's mm. how I, that's why I was just like, I'm starting over. Look at them get another chance. This is my chance. And it just, I, I kind of just have been obsessed since. So, I mean, the minute my kids, they're grown. Uh, my son is a junior in college. My daughter's getting her master's in counseling right now. So they're wow. gone. I finished law school. I was like, let's do it. So the minute I was done with law school, I started applying because <laughs> I was like, they don't need me. Like, let's do this. So I've been obsessed since. Yeah. Incredible. So let's put this obsession to the test. Give me yeah. a survivor winner and give me a non-winner who you identify with the most. It could be personal. Oh. It could be strategic. Such what do you think? Question. Such a good question. <laughs> so Sheree, I identify, get off the couch, get on the show. I mean, that's, that rings true for me. Um, and she did not win, but dang it. She was an inspiration. So mm -hmm. I most identify with that. So many good winners out there. I, now I am not very, I'm not similar to Sandra. I don't have that I mean, she's just a powerhouse, but I can't help it. I, she's, she is the queen of survivor. Um, and I just, I, I adore her. So one, I mean, she played different, right? She mm -hmm. played not to loops, but it worked for her. And I'm 49 years old. I'm going after these youngins. My strategy, they're always like, what is your strategy? And I want to talk a big game and I want to act like I got this strategy and I'm going to get to know them and fly under the radar. But I got this huge target on my back. I am, I can't talk. Now, I do have 20 somethings as children, so I can do it a little bit, but as mm. a mom, and I'm, and I don't want to not be me. Like, that's yeah. one thing they will see through. I mean, you can't just be like, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, I have no idea. So I can't fake it. So I guess, but playing not to lose, man, I don't want to get cut first. I guess if I can avoid the target long enough, then I can play the game. So that's mm -hmm. what I would take from Sandra. Yeah, let's talk about your perception a bit. Because, yeah, I mean, you obviously you talk about the demo and how that obviously varies over the course of Survivor history. I mean, are, are you really thinking about the way that people are going to view you? And is that something you want to play into do you want to be the mom of the tribe right so I think I'm gonna to have to uh, it's so hard to foresee I mean yeah. hindsight is gonna be 2020 I mostly want to build connections I'm good at that I mean that's my job I'm an estate planning attorney now I gotta learn I gotta get people's trust they gotta tell me everything but I got a suit <laughs> in those interviews they come knowing that I'm going to take care of them. We have the roles established. So, but I do want to build that connection. I I mean, gosh, in all the seasons, they keep people around that are not annoying, that mm. they should cut. But I'm like, God, just don't be annoying is what I tell myself. <laughs> like if I could just be useful and I'm, I'm a hard worker, yeah. but that's like the first stage and there's so many stages of it. So first stage is just don't go to tribal, like be tribe strong. So if I could build that <laughs> and be useful, that would get me, I'm hoping, I'm hoping. Yeah. So from a prep perspective, because like you said, you love to keep your planner stacked to the nines. Have you been able to put the time into preparing for the show? What have the, the steps you've been taking in the months leading up to this? That's a very good question. I, when I 
didn't make it last year. I finished training for a half marathon, but I tailed that down for this year. Cause I'm like, what good does that do me out on an Island? <laughs> yeah. But I do. So I'm, I'm typically a 515 riser so I can get my workout in. So I've made it a point, but like I said, yeah, I stay busy, but my kids are out of the house. So it's me and my dog. So we go for runs, we work out and then I can work throughout the day. And I gave up caffeine months ago. It was very sad, but it was those kind of things that I'm like, nope, nope, don't you want nothing? You don't need to need anything. So, and try not to, I've been sleeping well, but I'm like, you're not always going to get to sleep. So one, I'm like, nope, go ahead and get up, go work out. What are you going to do? Let's do it. And I've been watching the show like it's my homework and it's painful. Like when you know you're going to be on it and then you watch the show, it's not as fun. (laughs) It's hard because it's fun sitting on your couch going, oh, I can't believe they did that. Oh no, this is what I would do. And I'm, I'm the biggest fan. So I will completely do all that. But knowing you're going to be one of them, like, I'm almost like, oh my gosh. Like I pause it and go, okay, what would I do right then? I don't know. I got to see what they did. And it's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Give me one life experience you feel has prepared you most for the game. Was this this transition into the law or was there something else that you feel like is going to play out very much so on the beach? That's a good question. I think it's my willingness to adapt. Yeah, Mm. I think that my, not just going from state on mom, art teacher to attorney, but also just my life being an attorney, getting the first job, sticking with it, maneuvering my way through that firm. I'm working on a transition with another firm right now, which I told them, I said, hey, this is awesome. I'm so excited, but I'm going to need a little bit of time before I, you know, come. Because how do you explain being gone five weeks? So I'm like, ah, I, I've got, a, you know, I haven't taken a vacation in like 10 years. So and they're like, oh, good idea, good idea. So that's, but it's those things, how to maneuver. It's, I feel like my life has been made for Survivor. Before I even started the law class, I, I didn't know how to be a stay-at-home mom and pay bills. I started being a muralist. I'm not that good at art, but if I could see it, I could paint it. So I did. I started a whole mural company. Then 2008 hit. I mostly did churches at the time, but let me be honest with you, people tithe last, not first. So the church's jobs were gone. (laughs) So then I was like, okay, I will teach art classes out of my home. I did that. I needed more money. I became a nanny. I took four extra kids for four years. So I feel like my whole life has been surviving, like, which is, I think why I like the game. Yeah. It's a challenge. It's adaptation. It's what do you do when things go bad? Do you thrive or die? And I'm like, let's do this. So now I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm here. What have I done? Well, let's talk We're a bit about, well, let's talk a bit about your competition, about the other bodies that'll be uh, at those tribes for you. What do you value in an alliance partner? What characteristics are you looking for in like a ride or die or a number one? Great question. So in my mind, I, my first phase is let's not go to tribal. Mm -hmm. We got to win. That's just, and I see over and over and, and maybe, I mean, you might watch me and I play it different, but I'm like, don't cut the strong players. I don't care if they snore. I don't care if they're annoying. Like, we go back to tribal if you're there. So for me, I, my plan as of now, and maybe I'll adapt, we will see, um, is to pick a strong player. Now, will that hurt me if, because I am a loyalist, oh my gosh, and that could Mm. hurt me, but I do plan on, if I make an alliance, I want to prove strong to that alliance, so, but that's also, I kind of want to be truthful and be like, dude, I got your back till merge, if that will hurt me, that might hurt me, but like, that's honest, because I'm like, that's a whole separate game, like, Mm -hmm. let's do a second game, but the first game, which is what I'm just a little Sandra in me. Let's just make it. <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, let's just, and I want to be like, I got your back. If you're a strong player, 
but it doesn't necessarily mean strength. We need the smart puzzle people. Um, so let's just, who is, and that's why I've been working hard not to be a weak link. I mean, mm. I'm not going to compete with the 20 somethings <laughs> on my best day. So I got no illusions of that. I just don't want to be seen as the weakest link. So good, good alliance would be a strong player. Now of the people you're currently walking around with making eye contact with do you find anybody that fills that category for you is described to be somebody that like uh you might look at and say okay this is who i want to work with if you know the cars fall where they do is there somebody also that might be giving you red flags where you say okay i'm gonna write their name down first chance i get i don't have any that i would write down i mean everyone's been it's only eye contact so right. it's only just like <laughs> looking so but they're, you know, I'm sizing people up. And even those that don't look really strong, I don't want to stereotype, but I'm kind of like, you're smart, aren't you? You're mm. smart. Like, I try to look and be like, oh, yeah, you're doing that Sudoku. How fast are you doing it? Okay, okay, there's promise there. I, I see you. Um, so there's, I, I can't, I can't, I'm going to go with what cards I get dealt. We will see. Mm -hmm. Let me throw a couple scenarios your way to finish things off. So you're in the pre-merge, you're around camp, a boat shows up to your tribe and says, you all have to pick one person to send on a journey. Who yes. are you picking and why? Are you trying to send yourself? Are you trying to will someone else to go? I'm going to try and let someone else go. The last couple seasons, which it's been, it's really about risking your vote. And, I, and I'm and i sure everybody's got their own thoughts on this, but I. Man, I started watching, like I said, 2015. I've watched the ones before and after, but that vote is your life. And mm. everybody is like, I got to risk it. I mean, but why? Just because you've got the chance? I don't understand that logic. Like, well, here's a chance. I got to risk it. So, but now a lot of it is they're forcing you to. It's like, hey, you've already lost it or this or that. So mm. I I don't want to give that up. I I I think that that's just power in the game. So I would, I would send someone else. What is your hottest survivor take? What do you think is your most controversial opinion about a season, a player, the show? What do you think it is? Hmm. Oh, that's, that's a good question. I work really hard in my life not to be controversial. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. I haven't thought of that. I, it could be what I just said, which is, I mean, I feel like there's pressure, take risks, you know, do it. But I, I'm like, I, I am taking risks. I'm on this show, but I think the best thing to do is to make it to the end. And I don't agree that you have to take every risk that's thrown at you. So I don't think that makes me a weak player either. I think no. it makes me a smart player. 100% work smarter, not harder when it comes to just hustling to get it. Yes. Final thing I want to ask. Yes. Give me a celebrity or a fictional character that you would want to bring out as a loved one for a loved one's visit. Who are you picking and why? <laughs> um, goodness. That's hard. Mm -hmm. Um, so bring someone with, let me think. Um, so it can be fictional. It's could anything. Be, could be a celebrity. Can't bring, my, can't bring my real people. Nope. They gotta stay home. <laughs> We're keeping them at home. home. So, well, if it's um for a family visit and it's, I mean, even with the uh, many celebrities and that, um, man, I'd stay in survivor world. I'd bring out Boston Rob if he could come and I'd be like, man, one, if it just pretended like we were buddies, <laughs> I feel like, yeah, this is like uncle, cousin, I don't care, whatever, boss or wobby, <laughs> he's my age. So I didn't mean to insult him. <laughs> like, this is, but like, <laughs> um, yeah. And I'd be like, dude, tell me what to do here. Um, yeah, I would probably stay with survivor world. I mean, get all the advantages you can get, even if it's a fix fictional question i'm going with it <laughs> yeah listen and other advantages in the game yeah maybe not so much advantage in the form of boston rob as a family member go for it any chance you get right right <laughs> well i appreciate your support on that hello hello sir how are you doing I'm, I'm wonderful having a good time 
Fantastic. Nice to meet you. I'm Mike, uh, representing Parade and RHAP for you today. Let me get your uh, your bio line. Who are you? Where are you from? My name is Sifu, and I'm from O'Fallon, Illinois, like 15 minutes from St. Louis, for reference. <laughs> uh, I, I love, you know, I've been doing Tai Chi my whole life and uh, martial arts ever since I was six years old. So definitely going to play into this whole game. Yeah. So I'd love to hear about like, we talk on Survivor about resume, but like your work resume is so interesting from what I've been reading up where you are like a musician and then you worked at Walmart and now you're a gym owner. So like very quickly walk me through how you got through all those steps. Cause talk about making big moves. You made several from an occupation perspective. Yeah, from an occupational perspective, quickly, an overview would be uh, all the way from Walmart to working at a a local park that was taking half my check, then owning my own gym. Uh, But before that, I actually owned a bar in in St. Louis. And then after that, owned my own gym. And then uh, traveling and touring and playing music with uh, artists all over America, so... Wow. So what is this like a facet of you, this ability to just like tap into so many things? You seem like a modern day renaissance man to me. I, I try to be. Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, you can't tell by the beautiful, you know, shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you are definitely king of the jungle, I think, when it comes to uh, yes, yes. The, the impression you're trying to put out there. <laughs> Ah, you see, it's, you got to play mind games with them. But yeah, I think just all that, you know, is proof that I'm adaptable and I'm willing to go for what I want. Uh, I was always had to fight the adversity of being told you can't do this or having to fight, uh, you know, not being able to financially afford stuff or be, be able mm-hmm. to push myself to get to where I wanted to be. But I jumped through those hurdles with every bit of me that was, you know, wanting to fight back and not give up. I use that fuel to make myself better. And, and here I am playing music and, you know, teaching people and doing the gym life and that's it. You know, it's all I wanted to do. It's, it's, it's not easy, but it's worth it. Mm. And now we add survivor player onto that as well. <laughs> so talk to me about right, how that survivors. There we go. That'll be the eventual last step of the plan. But like, talk to me about how we got to this step right now. What made you decide that this would be yet another step in this adventure that you've had? Yeah, I just think I want to push myself and I want to make sure that there's no stone left unturned. There's a saying, and I'm going to botch it, but there's a saying that I don't want any uh, ghost next to my deathbed. And it's by Nelson Mandela. And, uh, you don't want to say what if, and you don't want to say I should have this or that. And when I watched survivor, I binged it all 40 seasons of it at the time. Uh, I got turned on to it. I was like, this is worth it. This is an adventure of a lifetime that, that speaks to my soul and everything I want to do in life, you know, to be primitive without food, you know, like around these random people you don't know, and to have to challenge yourself in every which way it just made sense for me. So call me crazy, but Never, never. So you, I'm assuming like found this during the pandemic or something and then decided, oh man, this is awesome. And then just caught up at an alarming rate. Uh, you know, what's odd and you'll probably laugh at this is my fiance and I, we actually started at season 40 and we watched winners at war. And so, yeah, right. So it was really strange because I had saw all the winners. And so for me, I told my fiance, I said, whoa, wait, wait, hold on. These are all the winners of previous seasons. We've got to go back. So I literally went back and it made so much sense why they were saying certain things and why they were doing certain <laughs> things. So I was like, this is amazing. Well, it's like walking at the end of a movie and being like, all right, I think I can figure it out from here. So all that being said, uh, I would love to hear from you. Give me one of those survivor winners and also give me a non-winner. Uh, I would love to hear one of each that you feel yeah. you associate yourself with, either from a strategic perspective, personal perspective, whatever. Uh, Tony Vlacos is one of the top ones that I, I relate to just his ferocity in the game, you know, with spy bunkers and, and his social work. And <laughs> I just thought that that was the season, I think it was uh, 28 Kageyan, uh, where it really made sense to me. Like, man, you could really go out, be yourself, play hard, have a fun time because it wasn't, it wasn't like he was like tippy toeing he was like literally out there being himself and like trying hard and that made sense to me resonated well with me but uh i you know i think that all in all the second player for me 
This is a tough one because there's a lot. Uh, it would be probably Wu. I really mm. enjoyed his play. But next to Wu, it would be either Ben. I know that I know I can only pick two, but it would be Wu, Ben, or um, no, Ben won. Ben won. Never mind. Yeah, Ben won his season. So it'd probably just be Wu then. Yeah. That makes sense from the Tai Chi connection, I would imagine. Yeah. So what would, <laughs> what, what would you say is one of your favorite moments in Survivor history? Is it around that Tony Wu connection or is it something else through all those seasons you binged? Oh my goodness. That's a tough one. Uh, I would say some of the funniest moments, yes, were when, when Tony was like, she's speaking llama, you know, <laughs> <laughs> those things stick out to me. Uh you know, the older seasons, you you always had more, like, uh, banter, like, behind people's back. I just thought that was all, so funny and hilarious. And then they turn right to him and just be like, yeah, you know, you're really cool. And they would just be talking crap about him. I, <laughs> I just think that some of those moments and then, uh, yeah, I would say, like, challenges, uh, just seeing the evolution of challenges and things like that, I just, I enjoy that all, so... So let's talk a bit about uh, your approach to the game. I guess to start, like, what was your prep like? Because it sounds like you are a busy man. And certainly I think the physical component is something that, I don't know, did you need to prepare for it differently than like your usual day-to-day stuff? What other type of stuff were you doing in the months before this? Yeah, uh, a lot. So I don't know if you can tell, I am about 220 something pounds. Uh, I had to fast. Yeah, I'm a pretty big guy. Yeah, (laughs) I had to fast. (laughs) <laughs> which was terrible because I usually eat like five, six meals a day, man. And so, yeah, right. So having to fast was tough Had to work out uh, early in the morning, like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. I would get up, hit the treadmill, hit the stair stepper. Um, and I would burn at least 2,400 calories a day. And so, yeah, people thought I was insane, but they didn't know why, you know, cause you can't really say anything. So <laughs> They're like, uh, Sifu, you've been to the gym like four times, you know, today. I'm like, well, you know, just I really am enjoying it. But yeah, I, I would say <laughs> I'm enjoying suffering. But I would say the sauna. Uh, I did that. I did some workouts in the sauna because this heat is incredible out here. Uh, so I just tried to replicate what I thought it would be as much as possible. Yeah. Seven days a week. Uh, well, so that being said, I mean, you talk about the physical presence and the space you obviously take up. What do you think people are going to perceive you as? How much do you think that plays into it? Is is that something you want or not? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think people will perceive me as a slight physical threat, but I don't, you know, I don't think it'll be like a physical threat to where it's so dominating. I think it'll just be like, oh, he's very, he could probably be very helpful in these certain situations because I'm more of a, I'm, I'm probably going to help like more of a group idealistic thing happen where we all help and we all pitch in, we're all doing this. So it's not all on me. Right. And I'm also not going to put too much light on me. Like, Hey, you know, I've been doing 20, 24 years of Tai Chi. I'm going to beat all the balance challenges. No, I'm not going to do that. Cause watch me get out there and I'm like falling all over the place. Cause I can't even, <laughs> I just said this, like, you know, so you don't want to, you don't want to put too much of a highlight on yourself before actually getting into it. You just want to go in with some confidence and that, you know, that physical and mental endurance. So. Yeah. So speaking towards the people that are around you, what characteristics do you seek in an alliance partner? What facets are you seeking out of like an ideal number one or ride or die on the beach? Yeah, I want to seek, or I am seeking honesty in a partner. Um, Someone that's going to be legitimate with letting me know, you know, if my name's coming up or what their are actually realistically what their plans are. Like, I kind of want to know what their ideal is. If they could lay it out from their head to me and then I can help articulate that, that's kind of the partner I want because it's their idea then and it's their plan but realistically mm. i'm going to be taking a piece of that and switching it or using that information to sell so <laughs> yeah so that being said as you're looking around the people that are you know in ponderosa alongside you i mean these are going to be either your best friends or your worst enemies for hopefully the next 26 <laughs> days are you eyeballing particular people based on first impressions of either okay if i draw the same buff as this person fantastic i'm going to the end with them or even the opposite major red flags from this person. I'm writing their name down as soon as I can. <laughs> I, I, you know, it, the, the energy is actually quite positive here. It, uh, at, you know, Ponderosa, I don't think 
there's anyone highlighted so far. Uh, there's a couple people that have been giving me the eyebrows and, and, and the eyes. You know, you don't really know what that means, but there is positive energy from uh, a few people that I've met. And so I think it's going to be an exhilarating season in that regard that it's a lot of people with a lot of different, you know, good energy. Mm-hmm. No one seems so negative, which they make whenever they're starving after like 48 hours. But <laughs> we're going to we'll get to that point. But I think it's all good. Give me your biggest superpower and your biggest piece of kryptonite, your biggest weakness in life and how that might translate to the game. My biggest superpower in life would probably be helping others. The ability to be empathic and sense uh, to love and care and to give back to the community. My kryptonite would also be that same thing. Mm-hmm. I would, yeah, I would definitely want to do that. And these are real people. It's not like fake people. You can say it's a game all you want, but you're next to human beings that have hearts, souls, families, and everything. And that's a tough, uh, that's where this game gets tough because you realistically are dealing with a person that is struggling, if not more than you, and needs that nourishment and doesn't have that, you know, safe space they're used to at home. So you, have to ha- I have to walk that fine line of and you know I'm not really going to give up any rewards but you kind of feel like you want to for someone suffering you know you got to walk that fine line of being human and playing the game out here and I think that'll be my kryptonite and my my superpower so I'm going to present a scenario to you let's say okay. pre-merge you're with your tribe hanging out on the beach being that generous person you talked about a boat shows up says pick one person to go on a journey now, you know what these journeys might do. Might be something good, might be something bad. Are you volunteering? Are yeah. you trying to like get someone else to go? What's your strategy for that? Yeah, I honestly, <laughs> I would try to use as much psychology as possible that I could to, <laughs> to make it seem to where they naturally would want to pick me. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, if you look at these scenarios, typically they are going out and getting advantages or going on a journey and getting uh, some sort of twist for the game. I want to be on that survivor twist. So I think I would present it in a way to where it's like, you know, I don't know what is going to happen, everybody, but I would be willing to volunteer for this. uh, If not, someone else can go. And Mm -hmm. with that being said, whoever presents, whoever else would present it, I would just say, well, how about you and I, we figure this out with rocks or, you know, I'll go this time, you go next time. I'll be kind of very forward with it. How much are you looking to look for advantages in the game? Is this something that you're trying to to hang your game on? Or are you going to try to be that guy that's, again, hanging around camp, providing more so than searching? No, man, I'm going to be searching. (laughs) 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 You know, but uh, but again, I'm not going to be the guy that says, hey, I'm going to get wood and I bring three sticks back. Like, (laughs) it's like I'm going to bring a bundle back. But there's going to be a damn idol in that bundle. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) every adventure out there, whether it's camp life, uh, you know, or getting water at the well, like I'm going to take each opportunity to search for an advantage. Why not? Your own survivor. It's one of my survivor bucket lists right there. Define it, you know, immunity idol. So what is your hottest survivor take? What do you think is your most like controversial opinion about the game, about a player, et cetera? I think that. And and this could be an unpopular opinion, but I think the new era of Survivor is the best version of Survivor. And I only say that because it's more inclusive. It's more uh, tangible. Like you can relate to people better. You're understanding more stories. I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but you got to realize there's so many years of the old Survivor Mm. to where it's going to be very difficult to see it. But I see it as a new way to re-immerse this game into the world to where people can really relate to it and it can and it can become more popular again and get back out there in the world so all right last question if you could pick a celebrity or a fictional character as your loved one who would it be and why to come out and visit you on the beach oh my fiance would hate this um (laughs) (laughs) so if i could pick a fictional character or a celebrity Mm-hmm. Oh Lord. Uh well the celebrity would be Jessica Alba. 
Um, mm. Well, now now I fifth, understand the preface. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the uh, the fictional character, oddly enough, would be uh, like Goku or like. I, I was gonna say I I, heard, I saw you were a big DBZ fan, so I was just waiting yeah, for the Goku, like drop. Goku or yeah, <laughs> or something. Uh, you know, like Piccolo or Trunks, one of those guys. That way, they can just help me out. <laughs> oh yeah, Tr Trunks comes in with just that big katana that he used to cut Frieza's dad yeah. in half, and like, there you go, just cut a swath <laughs> in the game. That's all you need. Exactly. Yeah, that's well, something that people don't know about me is I'm a DBV like DBZ fan like crazy, like all the way from Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball GT, Dragon Ball Super, Dragon Ball Superhero, all of them, every bit of them. Well, hoping you go, you know, full Super Saiyan four by the end of this, that you got blue hair by the time the twenty six days are over. It was so great getting you to talk with you, man. Get your perspective into everything. I think you have a really great head for where things are at, and I'm, I'm hoping you keep it by the time the game is over. So I wish you the best of luck, man. I really look forward to seeing what transpires some, several months from now. Excellent. Well, I'm glad you're talking to the new winner survivor. I appreciate you doing <laughs> this for me, and I cannot wait. <laughs>